Thank you all for being here. Um, tonight, we're pleased to be hosting Oxford University's mathematician, Professor John Lennox, and acclaimed journalist, Christopher Hitchens, in what I'm sure will be a memorable evening for all of us. Of course, as most of you know, this event was originally slotted to be between author and pol uh, political observer, Dinesh D'Souza and Mr. Hitchens. Um, but due to a major family surgery in India yesterday, Mr. D'Souza could not join us. Professor Lennox, however, was planning to be in the very seats that you now occupy, um, and so when we discovered that, we asked him if he would, was willing to participate rather than spectate, and he has graciously agreed. It was very providential. Or, if you prefer Mr. Hitchens' perspective, it was almost providential. <laughs> almost. <laughs> I had to get that in there, Mr. Hitchens. I'm going to get a lot of mileage out of that. Um, we also thank Fixed Point Foundation for loaning Professor Lennox to us this evening and helping us promote the event since he actually was in town for a Fixed Point function. Now, with the help of more people that can be named, uh, Dr. Andy Westmoreland, Dr. Brad Creed, uh, University Relations Department, Student Involvement, University Fellows, many volunteers, and our own tireless group of officers, just to name a few, we are now pleased to be hosting a very high profile event on a very important topic. Indeed, what topic could be more important? And this is the Socratic Club's entire purpose, to thoughtfully engage and explore life's so-called great questions. I will state publicly that the Socratic Club is a Christian organization, modeled after the Oxford organization of the 1940s and 50s, which C.S. Lewis presided over. But just because we have an opinion on these issues does not mean that we are incapable of objectivity. If an idea cannot properly take its stand in the marketplace of ideas without collapsing, if it cannot survive without constantly being guarded from outside attacks, then it is not worth believing in the first place. We, however, think that Christianity can take its stand, and it is with such confidence that we invite thoughtful opposition, such as Mr. Hitchens, to engage us in what we hope will be a very fruitful dialogue. C.S. Lewis once noted, in any fairly large and talkative community, such as a university, there, are always the, there is always the danger that those who think alike should gravitate together into coteries where they will henceforth encounter the opposition only in the emasculated form of rumor and that the outsiders say thus and thus. The absent are easily refuted, complacent dogmatism thrives, and differences of opinion are embittered by group hostility. Each group hears not the best, but the worst that the other groups can say. Christian though he was, I think that this is a sentiment which any thoughtful person can agree with and is exactly the problem we are trying to combat. We want to bring the best of both sides to bear. I think you will agree with me that we have done fairly well this evening. We have not put the worst of each side out here, but rather some of the best minds that each has to offer. It is with this in mind that we hope you will listen carefully and respectfully to what each man has to say this evening. Finally, before I uh, turn over the floor, I would like to remind you that filming and flash photography are prohibited. Fixed Point Foundation is filming the event, um, and if you would like to get footage of the event, you may contact them afterwards or on their website. I will now turn over the floor to this evening's moderator, Dr. Christopher Mitris. Dr. Mitris is a professor of English here at Sanford, the director of the recently founded University Fellows Program, and recent winner of the Macon Teaching Award, of which he was very deserving, if I may say so. He is also the faculty sponsor of the Socratic Club and something of a mentor to myself personally. If my classes have been any indicator at all, I think that I can say he has the gift of moderating in the Socratic style, which happens to be very fitting for his role this evening. And it is with that that I turn the floor over to Dr. Chris Meetris. I'll try to get us going. Thank you very much, Michael, and on behalf of the Sanford faculty, administration, and staff, I welcome everybody to campus this evening. Now, before we begin the actual debate, I want to briefly and very briefly introduce our two speakers and then go over the ground rules for this evening. Now, our first participant sitting immediately to my left is Mr. Christopher Hitchens. Mr. Hitchens is a journalist, a literary critic, and a political commentator who is one of the most widely recognized public intellectuals of our day. And although he's the author of 17 books, he is perhaps best known for his most recent book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, an international bestseller that, among other things, mounts a vigorous challenge to religious faith and its role in contemporary global society. An independent thinker who resists classification, he has carved out a unique place for himself 
in America's current political and social landscape. Please join me in welcoming to Birmingham Mr. Christopher Hitchens. Our second participant this evening is Professor John Lennox. Dr. Lennox is Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University and Fellow in Mathematics and the Philosophy of Science at Green Templeton College, Oxford. Early in his career as Senior Scholar at Emanuel College, Cambridge, Professor Lennox attended the last lectures of C.S. Lewis, and since that time he has emerged as a Christian apologist in his own right. Although his speaking engagements have taken him all over the world, he is perhaps best known to Birmingham audiences for his role in the God Delusion debate at UAB back in the fall of 2007. At this event, Dr. Lennox d debated fellow Oxford professor and leading Darwinist Richard Dawkins on the existence of God, a debate that not only surprised many in the international academic community for its spirited collegiality, but also helped to set an example for the possibilities of cordial but productive debate across ideological lines. Please join me in welcoming back to Birmingham, Dr. John Lennox. Now, I know we're all ready to go, but I do need to say a few words about the format tonight. Um, it's, it's outlined a little bit in your program. Uh, we'll begin with opening remarks. Each speaker will be allotted 15 minutes uninterrupted to offer these opening remarks. As the speaker nears the end of his allotted time, I will signal him with the statement, one minute remaining. Um, near the end of that minute, I will signal again, 30 seconds remaining. And should the speaker continue on, I will be put in the unenviable position of having to cut him off and turn the floor over to his opponent. Um, the same will happen at the 10 minute time allotted for rebuttal. Again, as we near the time, I will tell the speakers of one minute to go, then I'll remind them of 30 seconds to go. And then I will once again, if they keep going, be put in the unenviable position of having to cut one of our speakers off. I spoke to both of the gentlemen backstage. I told them how much I dislike being unenvied. So they have assured me that they will stay and act like perfect gentlemen and stay within their allotted time. Now, the rebuttal period will be followed by questions from the audience but we're going to do this a bit different than you might have done in another kind of discussion like this. We do not have microphones where you can queue up. Instead, we handed note cards to you this evening when you entered. If at any time during the, the discussion between the opening comments or the allotted time for rebuttal, you have a question, please write that question down on that index card. During the break between speakers, say when Mr. Hitchens has finished his 15 minute opening remarks, if you wish, pass your question to your right and we have volunteers who will pick up those questions in the aisle between segments. Those questions will be put in order for me, excuse me, and then I will take those questions and ask them of our two guests this evening. So, without any further delay, let's begin our debate, and Mr. Hitchens has the honor of opening first. Thank you, sir. Well, let me begin by thanking all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. By thanking you, Christopher, for that suspiciously terse, grudging introduction. <laughs> um, and by confessing that I'll have difficulty when I get back to the North, persuading my, my smart friends in New York that there's a Socratic society in Birmingham, Alabama at all. I mean, I told my publishers when I started, I want, to, I want to begin in Dixie. I don't want to do the usual book tour. I want to take the campaign through the South. And they said, but why would you want to do that? I mean, who doesn't know that it's one long white sheet toga party? Crosses crackling merrily on the lawn in the night breeze. Later on, they repair to an illegal still or hooch to reflect gloatingly on their multiple offenses against chastity, particular emphasis on the loss of virginity with domestic or even semi-wild animals. <laughs> so it's always a pleasure for me to go back to the, 
the liberal consensus and say to them, you know, you'd be surprised by how quite a lot of that isn't really true. <laughs> I stick up for you guys when I can, I really do. Um, now, I'm guessing that tonight I'm not speaking to a largely or predominantly Muslim or Jewish audience. If I was, believe me, I would find, try and find a way of unsettling you. I'm guessing that those of you who are believers are probably of the Christian kind. As you know, the atheist position is the following, that of the many hundreds, if not thousands, of gods and religions that humanity has invented in its time, we have three, roughly, uh, and only three, not roughly, only three alternatives in considering them. One is that all of them are true. One is that all of them are false. And the other is that only one of them is true. The first proposition is self-evidently absurd. They can't, all, they can't conceivably all be true. Indeed, there are mutually exclusive forms of Christianity, um, as, uh, just to take only one religion. Uh, that all are false seems at least possible. That only one is true is the position, say, of my opponent, Dr. Lennox, I think must be the hardest single position to take. But in the spirit of it, I'll, I'll assume Christianity, and I'll just remind you of a novel that probably most of you won't have heard of, but was once very famous. It was, it was called When It Was Dark. Has anyone heard of it or read it? It was, a, it was a huge bestseller just before the First World War. It was by a man called Guy Thorne. And the, the mise-en-scene of the novel is this, that news comes from Palestine that a grave has been opened, and that in this grave, the, the stone rolled away from the tomb. On a, on a, on a stone inside is, a, is the body of a man who's been scourged, uh, crucified, uh, had a crown of thorns pressed down on his head, and has a terrible wound in his side, almost perfectly preserved, Cadaver. And on the news of this, on the news of this terrible archaeological discovery, uh, there's a, the world undergoes a complete moral collapse. Because without the resurrection, or with, rather with definite proof that there was no such thing, that the resurrection was a fabrication, there's no further moral restraint on humanity. People are coupling like beasts in the streets. They give themselves up to plunder and theft and rape and murder and perjury without conscience. The, the a midnight of, uh, of civilization falls upon an unhappy world until it's finally discovered that the whole thing was a fabrication put around by sinister Jewish people and journalists and other untrustworthy uh, riffraff as a stunt. And then people can go back to being moral again. Well, you see where, perhaps you can guess where I might be headed with this. In my view, if every one of the gods that have been discredited, instead of the only the two or three left to us that haven't yet been completely shown up as man-made fabrications and joined Thor and Ashtaroth and Huitzilopochtli and the Aztecs and all the others. If all of these were proven to be fraudulent and false and man-made, I believe our moral dilemmas would be exactly the ones we face now. All of us, atheists, agnostic, philosophical, Socratic or true believer. We would still have to wonder about the purpose of our existence here. We would still have to wonder about the origins of the cosmos and of nature. We would still have to wonder about our duties to one another. We would still have to wonder about how to build the just city, how to reflect on truth and on beauty. All of these dilemmas would remain exactly the way they are, They're unaltered by any supernatural dimension. And our subject tonight is the the supernatural dimension itself, the, the chieftain of that dimension, the, uh, the concept of God. So I want to begin by clarifying why it is that I believe there is no such entity or person, and I want to go on to say why I'm relieved when I reflect that this is so, why I think it would be horrible if it were true or otherwise. And I think I'd have to begin with the distinction between theism and deism. Uh, even Thomas Aquinas' uh, famous five proofs of the existence of God, for example, are strictly speaking, hardly theological at all. They're essentially only deistic. They're about first causes or uncaused potential or latent causes. They derive the idea of a creator from various gaps and from observation of the rhythms and the patterns of nature and the cosmos. And they postulate that these rhythms and patterns would make no sense without 
a first cause. In short, they postulate nothing more than the argument from design, which, as you all know, is subject to a, a refutation that says, well, if there was a designer, then the designer must himself have been designed and threatens those who offer the uh, case with a, an infinite regression into a chaos. However, I, I would say it's not possible to refute this argument conclusively or, or utterly or finally. Uh, only one can point out, as I will, some gross absurdities and inconsistencies in it. I, but for this evening and for the purposes of tonight, why don't I simply grant that it could be true that there was an original creator and that that's a, a good and elegant explanation for how at least the cosmos and the process of life on Earth, two quite different things, got started? Why don't I just grant the deist his point? After all, in the time that I've written the most about, at the time of Thomas Jefferson and the time of Thomas Paine, both of those gentlemen deists, an intelligent person would probably have had no choice but to believe something very like that. There's no superstition to it. There's, no, there's nothing supernatural about it. But it leaves the theist, like my uh, learned opponent, with all, if I make this concession, it leaves him with all his work still to come. He still has to show, somehow, not only that there is a God, but that he, he himself, understands the mind of that God, knows the will or can interpret the will and wishes of that deity on such weighty questions as what is good, what is evil, uh, what foods may be requisite or what foods may be profane, uh, what sexual partnerships are allowed, uh, what sexual positions indeed uh, are licit or legitimate. Um, what days of the week are holy or otherwise, uh, whether, when or whether it is requisite to mutilate the genitals of children. Major questions where someone has to say, yes, I know we must do this because I happen to know what God wants us to do. Now, it's my submission, ladies and gentlemen, and I think it's a fairly modest one, that brilliant as a mathematician, Dr. Lennox may be, no person, no other human being, no other primate, no fellow mammal of mine, however clever they may be, is in any position to say that they know God's will, or God's word, or God's desire or intention. This information is not accessible to human beings, and therefore my first statement is this. Those who do claim that they know are already, in a sense, discredited. Uh, they're deluded, and in a sense, they, they are, they're the first ones who have to concede that the argument goes on without them because we have to be awed, all of us, more and more, all the time, more and more awed at that as we discover how much more there is to know by how little of it we do know or can know. It's only those who say that they know they are certain who we have to distrust a priori, if I can use that expression. Very well, hoping I've established that point just for the sake of the debate. Uh, we don't have a word a deist, though I think we should. I would say I was an a deist as well as an, a an atheist. I don't believe there was a prime mover. I don't believe there was a first cause of a divine kind. I think we have better and further and brighter explanations for the origins of things than the idea of a supernatural first cause. But some also would say we don't even really need the word atheist because, after all, I don't require a special term when I tell you I don't believe in a tooth fairy, you don't say, well, what's the word for someone who doesn't do that? When I say I don't believe in witches and I don't believe in the biblical injunction to kill them either, um, they don't say, why do you, what is it to be a non-believer in witches and witchcraft? When I say to a Muslim, your prophet believes in dust devils and jinns and the, the haunting spirits of the, of the desert, I, there's a, shows what nonsensical peasant superstition is involved in the, in the Muslim profession of faith. No one says to me, what, what word are you using to say you don't believe in dust devils and jinns? I think I, I can be generally credited with having good reasons for my doubt. However, I think that the challenge is a fair one because I think we are divided as between those of us who attribute our presence here to the laws of biology and the laws of physics and those of us who and we are modest in doing that, I think. We say we submit ourselves to the evidence, and even if it comes up with conclusions that aren't very welcome to us, we will accept them if they're well-founded. And those who are conceited enough, I would say, arrogant enough, in fact, to think that they are here as the consequence of a divine design. There's all the difference in the world between those two 
worldviews. And the big difference is one of them has evidence for it and the other doesn't. And one of them will say in advance what would refute it. I, w I can tell you if you ask me what evidence, w if presented, would mean I'd have to change my mind. And the theist will never do that. He will never tell you in advance, show me this and I'll stop believing in it. There's always an infinite replenishment of the infinitely renewable resource of faith going on. In fact, it's the humility of it that makes me laugh at it in a way the most. They say that they're humble, these believers in God. They want to be written up as, 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 as modest because they think that, of course, that God tells them they're worms, originally sinful, ingrates, incurable, uh, made out of dust in one narrative, out of a clot of blood in the Quranic narrative, bad, off to a pretty shaky start, uh, con con condemned since an original fall of man. Nonetheless, cheer up. The universe is designed with you in mind. This is a depraved form of sadomasochism in, in, in my view. It's not good for you to go from this terrible abjection and serfdom in the one instance to this belief that you are the center of creation and the object of the cosmos in, in the other. It's, it's a terrible alternation, a neurotic alternation between being much too servile and much too arrogant. But just locally, what, was it, what would it be to believe this? Suppose you did believe that everything that had brought us here was by design. Uh, well, we know that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed just on this planet have become extinct. So heaven has already watched almost 100% of its creation die off, often in very unpleasant, callous circumstances, with folded arms, right? And that's billions of years of geological time. Some people say the Homo sapiens has been around for 100,000 years, some for as long as a quarter of a million. No one says less than 100,000. Francis Collins, the great Christian believer who did the Human Genome Project, says certainly 100,000. I'll take 100. Richard Dawkins thinks it's more. I'll take 100. What does it mean if we're divinely supervised and divinely created and looked out for? It means that for 98 or so thousand of those years, Humans, homo sapiens, were being born, dying, half of them in childbirth, I would think. Life expectancy maybe of 20 years, maybe of 30. People dying essentially of their teeth, out of hideous diseases, living in permanent fear. Where are the earthquakes coming from? Where are the lightning strikes coming from? Why is all this? Where, where, what are these diseases that hit us? We don't know about microbes, we have no idea. Um, that's to say nothing about the fights with neighboring tribes over women, over land, over meat, over subsistence, the, the, the torture, the, the violence, the cruelty uh, that goes on. Um, I don't need to underline all of it, I hope. You can picture it for yourself. 98,000, the first 98,000 years, heaven watches this going on with perfect insouciance. And something like two to 3,000 years ago decides, right, we have to intervene now. We have to do something about this. Well, what would be the best way of intervening to try and redeem this rather bleak picture? What about having somebody tortured to death in an obscure part of the Middle East? That ought to cure it. Or if you're a Muslim, what about getting an illiterate epileptic shepherd to start babbling and saying that he's been talking to an archangel? Or what, or what about um, inventing the figure of, of Moses in the, a, a, a mountain that's never yet been found by any geographer of Mount Sinai. That's what you'd have to believe. This is, I've got a minute, right? That's what you'd have to believe, and that's why I ask myself, why do the worshippers of this God want to convict him of being such a crummy designer, most of his creations die off, and the rest suffer miserably, and, and the redemptive offers just don't somehow take, of being cruel and capricious and bungling and, and incompetent. Why, and, and callous uh, as a father. And so, since this is as far as I can get now, I have to tell you why I don't think the idea of an eternal father is a good one in any case when I next get the chance to draw breath. But thank you for staying with me this far. <laughs> Okay.
questions? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure for me to be back again in this university, and I'm delighted to once more meet Christopher Hitchens. It's a delight to meet an Englishman who's an American citizen on his own territory. I agree very much with Christopher Hitchens. It is repudiation of many of the evils that he claims have been done in the name of God. But I've learned to distinguish between the greatness of God and the inexcusable evil that has been done by those professing his name. And so I do not deduce that God is not great and that religion poisons everything. After all, if I fail to distinguish between the genius of Einstein and the abuse of his science to create weapons of mass destruction, I might be tempted to say science is not great and technology poisons everything. What is more, as I look back at the evils of atheist regimes of the 20th century, I might also be tempted, ladies and gentlemen, to say atheism is not great. It has poisoned everything. As it is, I hold that science shows some of the greatness of God. The famous physicist James Clark Maxwell, who discovered electromagnetic theory, inscribed above the door in his laboratory in Cambridge University the words, great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Yet Christopher Hitchens says, thanks to the telescope and the microscope, religion no longer offers an explanation of anything. I find it impossible I find it impossible as a scientist to take such a statement seriously, as if using a microscope and a Rembrandt painting could disprove the existence of Rembrandt himself. The idea that God and science are mutually exclusive explanations of the universe is as wrong as saying that internal combustion and Henry Ford are mutually exclusive explanations of the automobile. They are complementary explanations. One explains how it works, the other why it exists. To think that as the reach of our instruments increases, the greatness of God the Creator somehow diminished is to make the mistake of confusing mechanism with agency. When Newton discovered the law of gravity, he didn't say, now I know how the universe works, I don't need God. No, his wonder at how it was done increased his admiration for the Creator who'd done it that way. And Newton wrote the most famous scientific treatise of all time, the Principia Mathematica, in the hope that it would persuade the thinking man to believe in a deity. Telescopes can show us the wonder of the night sky, but science didn't put the stars there, nor did the laws of biology and physics, ladies and gentlemen. They describe what is there, they don't put it there. Stephen Hawking says the usual approach of science of constructing a mathematical model cannot answer the question why there should be a universe for the model to describe. He then asks, why does the universe go to all the bother of existing? Does it need a creator? Yes, it does need a creator. Alan Sandage, widely regarded as one of the fathers of modern astronomy, discovered quasars, said, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence, why there is something rather than nothing. And another giant of cosmology, Arno Penzias won his Nobel Prize for discovering an echo of the Big Bang. But Penzias could see how unimaginably greater is the God who conceived of this beginning to space-time in the first place. Astronomy, he says, leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with a very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Einstein had the brilliant insight that the speed of light was an absolute constant. 
But what shall we say of the creative mind that said, let there be light, and there was light. To measure the speed of light is one thing, to create light is another. Far from science showing God is not great, as Christopher Hitchens suggests, the very opposite is the case. It was belief in God that motivated the advance of science in the 16th and 17th centuries. Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, Newton expected to find law in nature because they believed in a great lawgiver. Now, so often we hear the new atheists talk about faith and deprecating it. But I want to tell you that scientists are all people of faith, as Einstein saw. They believe that the universe is accessible to the human mind. And physics cannot explain that for the simple reason that you can't do physics without believing that the universe is intelligible. So scientists required faith, and yet I read Christopher Hitchens saying, if one must have faith to believe in something, then the likelihood of that something having truth or value is considerably diminished. Pardon? Well, one must have faith that the universe is intelligible to do science. So I am to deduce, am I, that the likelihood of science having truth or value is considerably diminished? Exit science then. And I presume that Christopher Hitchens, like most of the rest of us, believes in his own existence. Yes, am I to take it then that the likelihood he really does exist is considerably diminished? His statement is a self-refuting statement. And I find it ironical that the so-called new atheists are so passionate about ridding the world of faith that they appear to be blind to the fact that they themselves are driven by faith. They believe that their minds can grasp truth. They believe in science. They believe that God is not great. Yet Mr. Hitchens informs us in a classic oxymoron, our principles are not a faith. Our beliefs are not a belief. The mind boggles, ladies and gentlemen. That is not the only irony, for the new atheists offer no ground for the faith that they themselves cannot do without. After all, if human life has been cobbled together by mindless, unguided processes, why should we trust our cognitive faculties and the validity of any belief that they produce, atheism and science included? John Gray gets it exactly right. Modern humanism is the faith that through science, humankind can know the truth and so be free. But if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, this is impossible. The human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. Well, this reduces all rationality to zero. And far from atheism being great, it seems to me that it is irrational, anti-scientific, and incoherent, even though emotionally its proponents seem unable to take this on board. Now, as the early pioneers of science saw, the rational justification of science is provided by the existence of the creator who created not only the universe but the human mind that studies it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. That makes perfect sense to me as a mathematician. Science is important, but it has its limitations. It cannot answer the questions of a child. What are we here for? What is the meaning of life? Nor can it tell us whether literature or art is good or bad. Hence, an atheism that insists that science is the only way to truth diminishes human beings. This is very obvious to many of my Russian friends. We thought we could abolish God and retain a value for human beings, but we found we couldn't. Do away with the greatness of God, ladies and gentlemen, and you can do away with the nobility of human beings endowed with all the potential of hearts and minds made in God's image. You also do away with their freedom. You are left with a mindless, unguided process that somehow threw humans up at its endless lottery to exist without ultimate hope for a tiny moment, only to be crushed by the same blind forces that produced them. Some freedom that... Another evidence of the greatness of God consists in the ordinary freedoms that we often take for granted. 
Here's an influential German atheist thinker, Jürgen Habermas, and he says this, Christianity and nothing else is the ultimate foundation of liberty, conscience, human rights and democracy, the benchmarks of Western civilization. To this day, we have no other option. We continue to nourish ourselves from this source. Everything else is postmodern chatter. It was Christianity, not atheism, incidentally, that originally gave us the universities that educated the new atheists, gave them the liberty that permits them to propagate their views and the law that protects them as well as the rest of us. And yet Christopher Hitchens insists that the God he does not believe in is a tyrant and a bully, as we've just heard. I don't actually believe in such a God either. It is so alien to my own knowledge and experience. But I might point out as an aside that atheism is no solution to tyranny either, as the bloodbath of the 20th century shows only too well. But there's another deep problem here. To say that God is not great is a moral statement. To say he's not, he's tyrannical is a moral statement, and that must be based on some moral standard. Otherwise, you couldn't distinguish evil from its opposite. But if there is no eternal base for values external to humanity, how can Mr. Hitchens or anyone else's standards be anything but limited human conventions, ultimately meaningless products of a blind, unguided evolutionary process? How can random mutations and blind selection produce any morality at all, let alone the kind of apparently invincible morality that justifies the new atheist intolerance of religion? John Gray points out that the new atheists defend liberal freedoms without asking where they come from. Hard atheists like Nietzsche, Camus and Sartre will want to know how atheists can rationally justify their absolute sounding commitment to timeless values without implicitly invoking God. They would say you cannot. And Richard Dawkins gets close to hard atheism when he says that in a universe of blind physical forces, you won't find any reason or rhyme or any justice. The universe has the properties that we should expect if there is no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. But if Hitler or Paul or you and I are simply dancing to our DNA, no one can blame us for anything. All morality is gone. So the claim that God is not great, being a moral claim, dissolves into utter meaninglessness. And here we meet a strange contradiction. That the atheism seems to me, ironically, to deny the one thing that upholds moral values, that is justice. For millions, ladies and gentlemen, there is no justice in this life. And according to atheism, they will never get it after death, since death's the end. So the terrorists who danced their DNA on the bodies of their victims get away with it. They will not get away with it, ladies and gentlemen. Because here is another aspect of the greatness of God, that he is the ultimate judge of mankind. There is to be a judgment at which justice will be done fairly. In England at the moment, atheists have paid for an advertising campaign where buses carry a message there's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. Why is it that atheists associate God with worry? Is that they fear to meet him as judge? They don't like judgment, but I can't help noticing sometimes how judgmental they are. German Marxist thinker Max Horkheimer said a very interesting thing. He feared there might not be a God, since then there would be no judgment and no justice. And here we have a dilemma. The problem of my human guilt on the one hand and my desire for justice on the other. I want justice, but what will justice say to me? And what about God? Is he really the despot they make him out to be? No, there's yet more to his greatness. God is not only the great creator and judge, he's a God of grace and love. And the central claim of Christianity is this that as an expression of his love, God himself became human. The word became flesh. Christ shows us as none other the greatness of God. He made unique claims to be the truth, to be the son of God and backed them up by a life and teaching without parallel. 
But his moral teaching was not his main message. His stated mission was to deal with the moral chasm that separates us humans from God by taking our sins on himself. Ladies and gentlemen, we scientists cannot even tell you what energy is. So don't be surprised if I cannot completely explain to you the deepest mystery of our universe's history, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Yet just as we see the effect of and use energy without completely understanding it, what I do observe is the transformation, the peace, the hope that comes into the lives of ordinary men and women who learn to place their faith, their confidence, their trust in Christ as Savior and God. I see in them and experience in myself a transcendent sense of purpose that atheism does not have and a hope that atheism does not know. It is here, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the greatness of God is supremely manifest. Thank you. Mr. Hitchens now has uh, 10 minutes for rebuttal. Let me remind you again, if you have questions, please write them on the index cards and pass them to your right. Well, let me do this in reverse order and see if I have enough time left over to complete my first burst, as it were. I think I gave you fair warning, um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that Dr. Lennox would have to claim to know more than he can possibly know, and he by no means let me down. Uh, He knows that he's saved. He knows who saved him. He even knows who hung the stars uh, in the sky. How he knows this, I don't know. It was a bravura performance in its way, but I don't think if you're going to claim to know who put the stars up there, that you should be citing Albert Einstein. If, if there's a copy of my uh, Portable Atheist on sale afterwards, and I hope there is, if it isn't, it is available at fine bookstores everywhere. Um, I have several pages of, of painstaking denials by Albert Einstein that he had had or ever had had any belief at all of any sort in a personal God or a savior, or a divine revelation. He was at pains to repudiate this, and he thought it was both sinister and childish, as well as unscientific. The furthest he would go would be an illustration of the distinction I labored in vain to make between deism and theism, between between a name you might give to a process, or an order, or a, a, a law of nature, and the idea of an intervening, vengeful, supervising, caring, God, a personal one. That's, that's the only distinction I hope to make, and it was one that uh, Dr. Lennox treated as if it was non-existent, as you may have noticed. Einstein may not be used by those who believe in revelation or personal God. Now, okay, on the something and nothing question, let's stay with science for a moment. Edwin Hubble noticed a few years ago, as many of you will know, that the universe was continuing to expand and at quite a rapid rate away from itself. And, But it was thought by people who were still thinking in what you might call Newtonian terms that though that rate of expansion was remarkable and rather alarming, it would obviously have to start slowing down, decelerating at a certain point. To the contrary, it's recently been discovered by a very brilliant physicist, Lawrence Krauss, that in fact the rate of expansion is increasing and quite rapidly. The universe is expanding very, very fast, very soon. If we hadn't been around at this particular point in time, there wouldn't be enough evidence left around in the red light shift for us to know that the Big Bang had ever even taken place. We're only picking that up from signals from a long time ago, which will soon be unintelligible. I'm saying soon, using billions of years as an index of uh, time, of course, light years, if you will. Um, uh, uh, Not light years, um, the distances. You know what I mean. Distances and times that are rightly called astronomical. Um, What does this mean? It means that, though there is now something, After all, I am here, I do firmly believe, and I'm very happy to see all of you here too, especially those of you who paid for your tickets. Um, It means that very soon there will be nothing. A lot of nothingness is headed our way. It's going to be all over quite soon. You can see it coming. Read the Lawrence Krauss, David Hubble's office, it's going to explode away, it's going to fall apart. And if that is, a couple of things don't happen sooner than that. We can already see the Andromeda galaxy in the night sky. You can actually see it some nights without really the aid of a telescope. Headed 
directly on collision course for our own. We have an appointment, ladies and gentlemen, with the Andromeda Galaxy. It's going to crash right into ours. There, there's something now. Enjoy it while you can. Nothing is coming. Whose design is that, may I inquire? Or perhaps before that, it's very possible that before any of this happens, we won't have to worry about it because our sun will simply swell up into a red dwarf. Our oceans will boil. Uh, life on this planet will become extinct and then the sun will collapse into itself and go the way that millions and millions and millions of other stars have. We can see them imploding and exploding and shooting themselves to death all over the sky as it is. Nothingness, there's a lot of nothingness. So those who want to claim the credit for the something, uh, who's, what deity is going to claim the credit for the nothingness? And who went to all this trouble, this fantastic explosion of, 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 of nothingness, these infinite spaces of nothingness, uh, and with the, with, the, with the destiny of destruction written in every galaxy, um, in order to create this one privileged planet with this one very shivering, uncertain, vulnerable primate species on it that's only been here for 100,000 suffering years and has only been offered redemption for 2,000. Look first upon this picture and on that. Look at the absolute extraordinary uh, scale that's proposed on the one hand and the, the absolutely, or not even microcosmic on the other. And I don't believe you can possibly take any claim of religion seriously here. Whatever is the explanation for this, people who say, well, since we don't know, we may as well say it's God, are simply drumming their fingers. They're wasting their time and they're trying to waste yours. Now, on this question of who's boss and why I don't think the Eternal Father idea is a good one. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only father here. I have three children. My job as a father is to get out of their way, is to do my best for them and then make room for them. What if I was to say to them, oh, don't worry, I'll always be here. Not as in I'll always be here for you, as in I'm never going away. You'll never see the back of me. You'll never get to say goodbye, Daddy. No, no, I'll always be here. In fact, I'll be here long after you've died. In fact, I'm rather looking forward to that because then I can uh, sit in judgment on you. This is not even a benevolent form of despotism, is it? When you allow yourself to think about it. It's, it's somewhat worse than I was saying before about the way that religion makes people first be terribly abject and then terribly solipsistic and arrogant and conceited. If it were true, that all these things are attributable to an eternal father who is unknowable except by those who claim, as Dr. Lennox does, sources of information denied to me and many other people, what would it mean at the minimum? It would mean we were living under an unalterable, unchallengeable dictatorship, which might or might not be benign. We've no assurance it would be benign. In my view, benign dictatorships are the worst, but that's another story. It would mean we were subjected to everlasting round-the-clock Surveillance, waking and sleeping. We would never have a private moment. Everything we did and thought would be known and supervised and invigilated and either rewarded or punished. <coughs> Even Big Brother in, the, in, 19, in George Orwell's 1984 couldn't be absolutely sure what all his subjects were thinking. But there was the crime of thought crime. You could be charged with it under the divine dispensation, no problem. You're convicted of thought crime before you've even had the thought, because everything is knowable. And how would the God who convicted you know? Because he'd already created you full of dirt and sin and wickedness. That's part of the design. And the horror of it, the fascistic element of it is this. You're created sick, and then you're ordered to be well. So you're created full of dirty thoughts and wickedness and wrong ambitions and and, and, and impure and foul nature, and then you're told, you better, you better cure yourself pretty fast, otherwise I won't be answerable for the consequences. This is the worst imaginable kind of unfreedom, and I have to say I distrust those who wish that it were true. In my opinion, the first, the original emancipation the, original, the, the first emancipation that humans must undergo is the freeing of themselves from this man-made and man mind-forged manacle. It, it might be asked, why don't I want it to be true? Why don't I wish it to be true? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, because once you admit that this, this 
despot exists. You will find yourself in the real world, in the here and now, subjected to the rule of man-made power, purely man-made power, ruled by other primates and other mammals who claim the right to do anything they want with you because they have God on their side and because their rule is divine. That's the, that's, that, this is not a theoretical danger. I'll illustrate it in a different way if you like on the, and take up Dr. Lennox's point about the origins of morality. If you think that... You, we wouldn't know right from wrong. We'd have no concept of good and evil, or the right action, or the wrong action, or the right thought, or the wrong thought, if we didn't have the permission of a supernatural celestial dictator. If that's where our ideas of good and evil come from, then let me ask two questions of you first. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the questions and I'll, I'll leave it with the questions. And I hope I'll get a, a response uh, later. Um, you must now, ladies and gentlemen, if you believe this, you must tell me of a right action performed or a right statement, moral statement made by a believer, such as Dr. Lennox, that I could not make myself or couldn't state myself, something that only he could do as a believer that was right and moral and I could not do because I'm not a believer. I've asked this question in a lot of places now and to a lot of people, including senior bishops and archbishops and others, I have not yet had an answer to it, and there must be a good answer if they are to make the claim that faith licenses morality and ethics. And then, my second question, corollary question, much easier. Please think of an, a wicked action done by someone purely because they are a person of faith. Think of an evil thing said or an evil thing done that is only done because the person is, is religious. You've already thought of one. The suicide bombing community is entirely religious, faith-based. The genital mutilation community is entirely faith-based. You know how it goes. Um, while these two questions hang in the air, I will bow out, let you brood on them. I hope you'll feed some of them back to me. And once again, uh, my thanks. And back to Dr. Lennox. Well, now, I'll not be able to deal with all of these, but let me do my uh, very best to talk about them. Uh, you missed completely my point about Einstein. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you noticed I didn't mention anything at all about Einstein's belief in God because I'm completely aware of all that Christopher Hitchens had said. The point I made was that Einstein believed that all scientists had faith that is a completely different thing, a faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe that was real faith. And my argument had nothing whatsoever to do with Einstein's belief in God. He mentioned in his initial speech that the idea of the creator had been completely refuted by the question, you must ask who created the creator and you get into an infinite regress. I discussed that with Richard Dawkins in my debate in Oxford. If you have to ask the question, who created the creator, that means you believe in a created God. And created gods are, are a delusion. We've known that for centuries and we don't need to be told it. If you say who created the creator, it means also that you cannot conceive of anything that's eternal. And I don't know what Mr. Hitchens' views on the universe are or in mass energy, but the incapacity to believe in eternal is essentially the issue. My final point on that would be this. I said to Richard Dawkins, I can ask you the same question because you believe that the universe created you. So I would like to know who created your creator. But he doesn't seem to have an answer to that. Now then you referred to the universe and its expansion and collapse from the beginning to the end. And you said, what's the point of the whole thing? I, I would agree with you if I believed that the universe was a permanent phenomenon. But one of the things I understand from the New Testament is that the universe never was meant to be a permanent phenomenon, but is a stepping stage. I cannot go into what the Bible has to say about the notion of new heavens and a new earth. 
But I would simply want to say that this is something that is very clear in the Bible itself, which claims that the universe will end up in a massive heat death. This is something not new with science. And the point is that God is going to have a new manifestation. And that is why his plans are much bigger than we see within the confines of this present universe. But there was quite a lot of emphasis in Christopher Hitchens' talk on certainty. He said those who are say they are certain are discredited. But he was absolutely certain when we spoke that um, supernatural is to be ruled out, that no one can know the mind of God. How is he so certain about that? If you can't be certain about anything. Ladies and gentlemen, I think this is actually important because I would not like to give you the impression that my certainty is the certainty of arrogance. It's rather this, that I believe that behind this universe there is a God who loves you and me so much that he's taken the initiative and revealed himself to us. And the key question that underlines this whole discussion is this, is there such a thing as revelation? Because then it's not a question of arrogance, it's a question simply of accepting things for which there is evidence. So I would zero in to the central claim of Christianity, which is this, that God became human, the word became flesh. And as a scientist, I want to say that my response to that is, is there any evidence for it that Jesus is whom he claimed to be? He claimed to be revealing God. And if Christopher Hitchens, for example, reveals something about himself to me, then it's not arrogance for me to believe it. But I will never know him unless he's prepared to do that. It's exactly the same with God. Unless he reveals himself to me, of course I cannot get to know him. But if he reveals himself, then that's a completely different situation. So it's got to stand or fall on the question as to whether there is any evidence for Christ's claim to be God. Because if he is God, then certainly there are some things that we can know about God for the simple reason that he has told them to us. And for me, of course, the central evidence is the fact that Jesus Christ uh, literally rose from the dead on the third day. Now, I'm sad when I hear uh, Christopher Hitchens' caricature of God as a celestial big brother, always watching us trying to spoil our fun. That is an invented God, ladies and gentlemen, because the God that I know is a God that cares for me and has created the possibility of a real relationship with me. I might as well say, who would want to be married and have a woman or a man in their home constantly watching them, constantly supervising them, constantly looking out for them? That would be absurd because it's to take one aspect of watching over and to distort it into a universalized explanation. Ladies and gentlemen, aren't you glad that there are police in this country watching over you? Aren't you glad that there are people? Incidentally, I think Mr. Hitchens and I are enjoying the fact that you're watching us tonight. And it's not inhibiting us at all. We're enjoying it. There's a watching that's good and there's a watching that's bad. And if you abolish God's watching... I notice that we ended up in the Orwellian situation in Eastern Europe with Big Brother watching. What did people think of that in 1989? They voted very clearly against that atheist kind of supervision. And it was in fact the Christians that led the silent revolution in Eastern Germany that knocked the wall down. There's a false kind of watching, and I agree with Mr. Hitchens on it, but there's a true kind of watching. Because the relationship with God is not something that's forced. It's a real relationship of love. We've been given freedom. I heard a real caricature of the biblical story in saying that God had created us sick 
God made a perfect world, ladies and gentlemen. But he made us in his image with the capacity of real freedom and real choice. So that if we say no to God, God will honor that choice. I wonder what Mr. Hitchens would want God to do with people that say no to him. He seems to have difficulty with the idea that God will honor the choice of those that say no. Why is that? Because God hates them and is some cosmic tyrant? Of course not. It's because God actually loves them. Now these things are sometimes hard to grasp because there are so many distortions of God around in the world. And that's why again and again, I come back to look at the person of Christ who reveals God to me to look at his love and his friendship and his care. And if I ask myself the question, would I like to be in the company of that person permanently? My answer is a resounding yes. I can think of nothing more liberating and nothing more utterly magnificent that expresses the greatness of God. Now we heard a challenge from Mr. Hitchens that he throws out all over the place. Can we think of a right action that can be made um, only by a Christian and not by an atheist. It's, it's actually a very subtly interesting question to me because there are certain presuppositions behind it that I'd like to briefly deal with in closing. One is this, from where I sit, ladies and gentlemen, whether a person is an atheist or a Christian or anything else, they are made in the image of God and therefore they are moral beings. Therefore they're capable of seeing good and doing good. And sometimes my atheist friends could put me to shame. So there is that basic moral compass, which makes Mr. Hitchens' question a little bit um, beside the point. But if I were going to answer his question directly, I'm not convinced that William Wilberforce would have liberated slavery as he did if his motivation had been atheism. Because I noticed that Wilberforce liberated slaves only to have slavery reintroduced by uh, Nazi Germany and communism in the 20th century. There is no guarantee, ladies and gentlemen, that the abolition of God will mean the abolition of the captivity of man. But my final answer to his question is this. Can I name an, a good action that no atheist could do? Yes, I can. I can name one that no person of whatever worldview could do, and that is to give his life for the sins of the world. It is that that characterized Jesus Christ as the one who was God, and that is unparalleled in its majesty and in its confirmation that God is truly great. Well, now I earn my bread. All right, uh, I've uh, received some questions from the audience and uh, put them in order that I, I think will be provocative. Um, the questions will be individually addressed to our speakers, but uh, I'd be more than happy to have them respond to the answers that the other gives. So we'll start with Mr. Hitchens. One of our guests tonight wants to know if your beef really isn't more with, to say, the concept of original sin and universal depravity than it really is with religion in general, that you have a very specific view of what religion is and that's what you have a problem with. Well, yes, I mean, I think all religions are, are equally untrue I don't, because I don't think there is a supernatural dimension to be appealed to um, or to be used as an explainer of what we don't currently know about our species or about the cosmos. I think you, you get along much better if you exclude that assumption. And you, that means you don't empower, if you can exclude it, if you can limit it, if you can limit it to a private belief, a belief people keep in their homes and so forth, which are, of course, are more than entitled to do. It means you don't find that you're dealing with a class of witch doctors, mullahs, priests, rabbis, and others who make a living in politics by saying that they have special rights because they're doing God's will, which has been a curse to humanity throughout its entire existence. 
and currently, I think, in the form of theocracy and its various bullying threats, represents a very direct, immediate threat to the survival of our species. So yes, we'd be better off without it. Would you like to respond to that, John? Sorry, I missed the thing that exactly that I need to respond to. Okay, well, that's all right. <laughs> um, I guess the, the... You mean we'd be better off without the doctrine of original sin? Perhaps... A, no, well, the question, John, was, was, um, it, it was to say, obviously, that wasn't my main objection. My main no. objection was to religion itself. And by the way, now you prompt me, I meant to say, I never said or meant to say that I attacked uh, bad behavior that was uh, undertaken or embarked upon in the name of, as you put it, religion. I think you were trying to be generous to me. I do insist that this kind of bad behavior is innate in religion, is part of religion itself. It's not an abuse of it or something undertaken in the name of. It's a direct consequence of the willingness to believe in the supernatural and the willingness to believe in a, in a supernatural dictatorship in particular. But I think that is the case in some uh, situations. And it is the case with some people who've named the name of Christ, but what I notice here is this, that Christ forbade that kind of behavior. He told his followers not to take up the sword. Why? Because his kingdom was not of this world. So people who behave like that in the name of Christ aren't followers of Christ, they're disobeying him. And I would want to argue that as we look at his character and his attitude, this kind of evil behavior is not endemic to Christianity. It's endemic in caricatures and perversions of Christianity. Okay. That's too easy. I mean, where, for example, where is, is it not written that I come not to bring a peace but a sword? Surely it is. Um, is it not written that those who won't follow me shall be depart, must depart and be cast into everlasting fire? Not a very gentle or pacific remark. Is it not said that if you don't give up your family, if you don't give up thrift, if you don't give up everyone who loves you and everything you love to sacrifice yourself for me, you're not worthy. Uh, these are strongly uh, coercive and implicitly authoritarian or even totalitarian uh, statements. And as C.S. Lewis rightly says, it's one of the very rare occasions where I agree with him, he said, you, you may not say that the preachments of Jesus of Nazareth are all right, even if you don't accept the religious uh, basis of them. Lewis quite correctly says, if you don't accept that this man was the son of God, you'll have to notice that many of his statements and sermons are either wicked or insane or both. It's only on the belief that the world is very soon coming to an end and that he himself has the right to claim a messianic role in this conclusion that any of it can make any sort of sense at all. And everyone here knows at least some of the examples of what would be counted as wicked or insane if the messianic claims were found to be questionable, which they have been. Okay. I would want to question that very seriously because, as I said, Christ forbade the use of the literal sword. So when he said, I came not to bring peace in a sword, we can see exactly what that means by the fact that he has uh, his message results in a division in society. That is, I have got to, I've got the choice to decide for him or against him. And he will honor that choice whichever way it goes. The one sword he didn't come to bring was the physical sword because when one of his disciples used it to cut the ear off somebody, Christ put the ear back on. Okay. So they say. Okay, well. The so they say comment may segue into the next question. This one's for Professor Lennox. One of our audience members wants to know, if you're correct um, about there being a deity, he wants to know, or she wants to know, why Jehovah? Why not Osiris? Why not Buddha? Why, in the words of one of our guests here, why is one myth or folktale more true than another? Well, first of all, I don't think they're all myths. I think there are many myths around in the world. And certainly the question is an important question because it makes the distinction between the kind of deism or even theism that responds to the design in the universe and so on and says, why this one God? My answer to that, ladies and gentlemen, is very simple. I have to decide that like I decide everything else. 
on the basis of the evidence. And the evidence in the case of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ has convinced me that he is God incarnate. So I base my faith on that evidence. And of course, each one of us must make up our own mind. Now, if we had time, I could explain that evidence in detail. But the, the, the point of the question is, how can we decide? We have to decide on the basis of evidence. Just as people who uh, take the atheist view, they think the evidence points that way. And mercifully, we're still a free enough society that we can make these decisions. But we must make them personally. Okay. Christopher, would you like to respond to that? Well, you'll have noticed that there are many moments in the New Testament um, Gospels, one of them, I'll take for a simple uh, reason that it's easy to remember, that the Messiah will come to Jerusalem riding an ass or a donkey. Um, there are many others, including what town he'll be born in and so forth, where it says in the text, and this was done so that the prophecy should be fulfilled, that it should be done, because they, they knew what the prophecies were. A virgin will conceive, for example, is, an, is another one, though the word in Hebrew, Alma, actually just means marriageable young woman, doesn't mean unpenetrated young female at all. But it's all reverse engineering. It says right there in the text, we're, we're, we're telling you this happened because that would mean that the prophecies had come true. So you, I think you might suspect a little, mightn't you, someone who's telling you literally as they're going along why they're telling you this so that the, the conditions of prophecy fulfillment can be met. But there's a much graver problem even than that naivete. Um, which is that these, these prophecies are of a Jewish Messiah to come. And the, the Jewish religious authorities of the time considered, and who were the, the nearest, much cl closer to being eyewitnesses, if the story is true at all, much closer than the authors of any of the Gospels. They were the people who were the religious authority in the area. Uh, he was a member, if he existed, of their congregation. They thought he was a sorcerer and a fraud and an imposter, and convicted him of blasphemy, because though he in fact never said that he was God, I don't think, I mean, there are some Christians I know who do say that Jesus is God, there are some who say he only claimed to be the son of, the critical question is, he's asked, art thou the Christ, are you the Messiah? And he gives a slightly evasive answer at this point, but it's enough to make the Sanhedrin rend its garments. So all you're seeing in this tale, if it be true at all, if it have any truth to it, is the origin of Jewish Christian fratricide. Okay. Uh, the, of the, the, the Jews who have nurtured the idea of prophecy and the Messiah through their prophets for generations, who believe the Messiah has not yet even considered deigning showing up, and those who tell the Jews, why are you wasting your time? The good news has already happened. Why did you just get with the program? I submit that neither of these propositions is worthy of the consideration of an intelligent or educated human being. It's, it's Bronze Age peasant Palestinian superstition. And, 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 well, I, the, the, and the competition over it and interpretations over it have made humanity's life even more miserable than it was going to be otherwise. Okay. Well, I, I know that and Dr. Its, Lennox has a response and to and that. In the third, and in the third form of plagiarism that it takes, which is the, the plagiarism of Islam from both Judaism and Christianity, the competition between monotheism has become really outright menacing. And the real responsibility of citizens is to, is to hold it down, is to resist theocratic bullying and the superstitions that underlie it. Okay. But, um, I want to move on to another question, but I I'll just give you just a few seconds to respond very briefly to that. Well, if and you're going to call it Bronze Age superstition, you'd be better to get it right. Because one of your statements there is just false. Jesus claimed to be God and they stoned him. Why did they stone him? Because you being a man make yourself God. The notion that he never claimed to be God is simply false. And well, you say prophecy is irrelevant and superstition and all of that. One of the things that I find very interesting about the Christian faith is it's not a mere philosophy. It's geared into history. And when Jesus came, there were various things that were predicted. He fulfilled them. But the biggest of all was the fact that he fulfilled ideas that had been current in Israel for centuries. 
that someday there would become a person who would die for his people's sins. Now that is a huge thing, of course. And it seems to me that those prophecies, when they are fulfilled, provide part of the evidence that this thing is much bigger than some little local thing happening in Palestine, although it happened there, but is geared into a whole revelation through history itself. So I don't find it a product of Bronze Age superstition. They were not superstitious in any more sense. For example, when uh, he mentioned the virginal conception of Christ, if I may just say a word about that, that when Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant, he didn't suddenly believe in a miracle. He wanted to divorce her. Why? Because he knew exactly as we do where babies come from. He wasn't stupid, nor was he pre-scientific. And it took a lot of convincing for him to accept what I believe to be the true solution, that this was a unique miracle of God encoding himself into humanity. Okay. So... Will you, will you promise to do it quickly? So if your wife is pregnant and you know it's not you, the only alternative is that it's the Holy Spirit. That's a false... David, David, Hume, deals, David Hume deals with this quite well. He says in the case of the laws of nature being suspended, you have to ask yourself, have they been suspended in my favor or um, am I possibly under a misapprehension? I think it's Thomas Paine who asks him, um, which is more likely, that the laws of nature are suspended or that a Jewish girl should tell a fib? We have to grow up out of this stuff, you know. Now, your problem, uh, Dr. Lennox, John, if I may say so, <laughs> yes, is, not, is not with me. Your problem is with Monsignor Ronald Knox, one of the greatest Christian apologists, first an Anglican, then an Anglo-Catholic, then finally a Roman Catholic, who in his book of apologetics very directly says Jesus of Nazareth never claimed to be God. It's not my problem. He claimed sometimes to be the son or let people run away with that idea. And to Jews, he was asked, the, when he was asked the direct question, are you the, the expected one, the awaited one, the one we want, the Messiah? He gave a slightly evasive, but they thought profane answer. Now, this, this is, my, my account of this is correct, I'm sorry to say. Okay, well, well I, I, think, uh, okay. I regret to say. I, think I just hate to cut off a good conversation, but I'll give you one last. Okay. Well, uh, it's too I'm, good I'm fascinated that he quotes David Hume and talking about the suspension of nature. David Hume has got about the worst analysis of miracles I've ever read in my life. First of all, he didn't really believe in the law of cause and effect on which you base laws of nature. Secondly, the laws of nature are not suspended in a miracle. It's God feeds a new event in. If I put 100 pounds plus 100 pounds or 100 dollars in my drawer tonight, 100 plus 100 is 200. If I find $50 in the drawer tomorrow, I don't say the laws of arithmetic have been broken, I say the laws of Alabama have been broken. Okay. <laughs> okay. But, but let me make the point from well, this. Well then, it's, well, wait a minute, I'm not well then, finished. Well then, you, well, then you admit there is no conundrum. There's no, no. no. There's no problem to be solved in that case. Yes, my knowledge There's of nothing the to be law, explained. There is. The knowledge... Not if it's covered by the laws of Alabama, it isn't. Right? <laughs> but just a second. My knowledge that one plus one equals two, I know that law, so to speak, tells me that another event has been fed into the system. And that's exactly what happens. My knowledge that dead men don't normally rise by observation means that if one does rise, not the laws of nature have been suspended or broken, but God who created the universe and built into it those laws which are not causes but are descriptions of regularities, he's perfectly free, of course, as the creator, to feed a new event in and then the laws of nature take over and a baby is born nine months later. Of course. I think Hume is completely wrong about this. Of course he's free. I will, I will let... Then on that, on that please, assumption... I'm on that assumption, then there's, n there's, nothing, there's nothing exceptional in, do you believe that the sun stood still at midday so Joshua could complete his battle plan? But I've just said Do you in fact believe that? I mean, that's, yes, there, that is how it was perceived. I, but you, let me go back to what you've just said. You've just said, Christopher, you've <laughs> just, you have just said that there's nothing exceptional in it. There is something exceptional in it. 
But the claim that the laws of nature are suspended as if they cause things is not true. No. It's that God has done something very exceptional. He has fed an event in and the way we recognize that is because we already know the regularities. If you didn't know the laws of nature, you could believe that everything was a miracle. Okay, do you want me to do one more or not? An out-of-wedlock out baby isn't something that requires a natural or supernatural explanation. It's its own explanation. The sun standing still at midday or the daughter of Jairus being raised from the grave or Lazarus being raised from the grave, neither of them with anything you notice to say for themselves uh, about this event. Um, the, uh, the account in the gospel of at the time of the crucifixion, all the graves of Jerusalem opening and all the, the tenants of all the graves coming out and walking around the city and greeting uh, people informally, uh, so rather suggesting that resurrection in the greater Jerusalem area wasn't that big a deal. Um, if you're willing to believe any of this, that's the sort of thing you're willing to believe. Okay, well, let's thank you very much. We'll move on to our next question. Uh, that was too good an exchange to interrupt. So um, this is for uh, Mr. Hitchens, and again, we'll do a little bit of free play on this. I bet we will. Yes, we will. <laughs> I imagine that's dare, what most folks came to see. I dare so. hazard that we will. <laughs> so. Now, are you willing to accept the view of Peter Singer that man has no ultimate dignity, meaning, hope, or value? If not, why not? Uh, no, um, then the why not is problematic, of course, because um, it, the, there is, whether you are a materialist or a supernaturalist, no particular reason to say that human life has any enormous uh, innate value. Um, after all, religion disposes of people in heaps and mounds and says, go out, we depart into eternal fire, you're, you're dust, you're nothing. If you don't have our faith, you're nothing, less than nothing, you're worse, you're evil, wicked, so forth. So these are, it, it's not as if by assuming a God, you suddenly find that life is all worthwhile after all. It's, if it was that simple, we wouldn't have to be having this discussion. I think this, if, essentially, I ask myself, why do I care? Um, why do I care, not just about myself and my children, but why do I think I often care in general? Well, if I didn't, I wouldn't belong to a species that would have got this far. It may sound a platitudinous answer, but I think there's some force to it. If we didn't have human solidarity, if we didn't realize that we are brothers and sisters one with another, that we have responsibilities, duties to one another, that these are not merely uh, reciprocal in evolutionary terms, in other words, you be nice to me, I'll look out for you. But they can involve real ties, real bonds of affection, friendship, even love. If we didn't know that we were um, able to think like that, and we, we, we exempt the quite large minority of humans who are born without this, the sociopaths and psychopaths, who I suppose we have to concede are also made in God's image, if you accept that tautology. Um, we, it's, it, it leaves nothing really unexplained. That, that, would ex that would tell us why we had warm feelings for one another and also explain why we were here instead of having joined the uh, species that went, all the other ones that uh, went out of business under the same divine supervision, I might add, including humanoid species like the Cro-Magnons and the Neanderthals, who it's quite clear buried each other with care and with love, looked out for one another and so forth and so on, but somehow didn't make some divine grade. Do you see where I'm going with this? I do hope so. Okay, John? Well, Peter Singer, what he thinks is extremely disturbing. I agree actually very much with Christopher that we find ourselves with these feelings and morality within us. I don't think that's the issue because my Christian faith guarantees those. Uh, to Christopher Hitchens as it does to me. The problem is the rational justification of this against the view of someone like Singer who is taking his extrapolations from evolution to a logical conclusion and ending up with views that uh, a newborn baby is of no more value than a dog, a chimp, or uh, a pig. In other words, devaluing human beings. And that seems to me to be a very serious direction in which society is going. If you teach people that they're no different from animals, it may just be they'll start to behave like animals. So what prevents me from going down that line is that I deny completely his premise. And his premise is there's nothing unique 
about human beings. I want to say there's something absolutely unique about them. They are, of course, animals, but they're more than that. They're created in the image of God, and that gives them infinite value and dignity. And we will jettison that at our peril. And I think it's being jettisoned in the name of a very seriously flawed philosophy, which is, as Nietzsche predicted, exactly what will happen if you attempt to live out atheism to its consequences, it'll end up in madness. I think it's actually Chesterton says somewhere that where, where animals are worshipped, humans tend to be sacrificed. And if you look at uh, ancient cultures, and some are not so ancient, that would tend to be true. I remember when, if it wasn't Singer, it was one of his disciples said that he, his own baby daughter was no more to him than would be, say, a rat or a flea or, um, well, let's leave it at that. I remember thinking, my first thought was, I'm glad I'm not his daughter. But my, <laughs> but my second thought is, I'm glad I'm not his pet rat either. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because well, it seems he doesn't have a great deal of sort of love to spare for anyone or, or anything. I, look, uh, animal rights can be overdone and, and certainly have been, by especially people who object to medical experiments in a hysterical manner. But we have learned a great deal in the recent past about our kinship with and commonalities with other creatures. And we've discovered amazing things about the capacity, including the capacity for family life, uh, solidarity, uh, society building, and so on, among pigs, monkeys, uh, dolphins, and others. And we know, uh, because of the uh, genome program, of our kinship with other much less uh, advanced creatures, um, and that we are only ourselves half a chromosome away from being chimpanzees. The one thing this is impossible to square with is the idea of us being made in the image of God. That, that's, that's clearly over. It clearly isn't. Anthropomorphically, <laughs> animalistically, whichever way you slice it, we, right. are, we, we, are, we are primates. So in what, in, okay, in that case, in the image of what God are the others made? It gets right. you nowhere. It, it's a me strictly meaningless statement. Yeah. It's interesting, it has no value. my geneticist friends in Oxford when the similarity between the chromosomes and so on, the DNA of animals with humans uh, was discovered, they said, well, we always told you so. It shows that it doesn't lie in the chromosomes. There's a lot bigger story to be told, I think, and it would be very premature to close the discussion on that basis. Stephen Jay Gould, was it he who said that we're not 98% chimpanzee, we're 100% human? Thank Compatible statement. Um, I'll ask another question in a moment that's connected to this. Just a word on the format. Because we did get started a little bit late, I do want to still keep some, uh, the 35 minutes we set aside for this kind sure. of give and take. This is a very important moment in the evening, so I, I don't want to sell that short. Absolutely. So we may go a little bit past 8 o'clock uh, um, to make sure that we have cool. this full exchange. This next question does address some of the issues brought up in the, in the last exchange. 63% of Americans do not accept evolution. And uh, that percentage may even be higher in the audience for this evening. Uh, the question for you, John, would be, what are the long-term consequences of this kind of mistrust of science? Well, I think, first of all, this could be a discussion for an entire debate, actually. How about six minutes? I would, <laughs> I would want to know, first of all, what you mean by evolution. If you mean simply what Darwin observed, that is the uh, fact that natural selection produces variation and so on, then that's not a particularly controversial thing. We can observe it. If you mean by evolution, uh, the notion that by unguided, mindless processes, life originally arose and comes to be what it is, I myself as a scientist find that unconvincing. And I find it unconvincing as a mathematician particularly because at the heart of life there is the database of DNA. And when we notice anything with a semiotic nature, language that is, language like 3.5 billion letters in exactly the right order, we immediately make an inference upwards, not downwards, to say that by whatever the mechanisms involved of getting this, it bears the telltale mark of an intelligence standing beside it. So it seems to me that there's a very healthy scientific debate to be had 
about the reach of evolution. And so we need to uh, define our terms very carefully. But not being an American, I can't really predict what's going on in here. The fact that people are suspicious seems to me to show that there's a real debate to be had. And all the evidence is certainly not, in my opinion, on one, on one side. The, the, um, the figures on uh, American belief in uh, things like virgin birth and the devil uh, and their doubt of things like, are, in my opinion, wildly exaggerated and uh, padded and are produced mm -hmm. by leading questions asked of the sort of people who happen to be in their kitchens all day and have nothing else to do. And what they tend to show mainly when you interrogate them is they don't even know what it is they don't believe in. I would instance Governor Michael Huckabee, for example, who says, of course he doesn't believe that he's descended from apes. Well, the theory of evolution is not that Governor Huckabee is descended from apes. He may know something about his family tree that I've also suspected in my time. <laughs> but it wouldn't invalidate the general proposition. Uh, so very, you, usually the people who don't know about Darwinism are the ones who say they don't believe in it, which isn't a fair test of anything. I'll just add on this point of not being descended from, but having things in common with our primate cousins. Um, we do, as Darwin says, bear the unmistakable stamp of our lowly origin. We do grow a coat of hair when we're in the womb and then shed it in the womb at about three and a half months. We do have vestigial tails. We do have um, appendices that are for the breaking down of stuff on the savannah that we no longer need to eat. And we do have wisdom teeth and other dentition that uh, we don't any longer require because we've, we, were, we were adapted to an environment that we, a savannah environment that we've long ago abandoned. So uh, saying that you're 100% human is only another way of saying that you're very much 98% primate. Voila. It's an, otherwise, it's a distinction without a difference. Okay. I think we'll, um, I'll ask this question. This is addressed to, to Christopher, but again, for, for both of you to address. Um, and I believe one of your early books, Letters to a Young Contrarian. So this may be a, a, an interesting answer for you to give. What advice do you have for someone who has left theism but, were, but was raised in an institution like Samford or in a church and is still in that institution. What advice would you give that person? You'll feel so much better if you uh, leave it behind you and go and study literature instead and the consolations of philosophy and the beauties of science. I think the real, these are things that are infinitely more awe-inspiring and wonderful and majestic than, than any invocations of the burning bush or, or the immoral doctrine of vicarious redemption, whereby a single human is made the scapegoat for all sins and we, we absolve ourselves not of, just of sin but of our responsibility by throwing our sins on him. A disgusting idea, fortunately, um, never happened. The, the question, that, the cultural question that remains, I think, is this. How are people going to live when they've given up the supernatural and the superstitious? Are we still going to need, I would say we are still going to need, the numinous and the transcendent? That's, that's innate in us too, as is reason, as is morality. And so the, the great struggle is going to be how, how we find consolation and, and beauty and reflection in, when we have come to terms with the fact that we don't have a divine dictator to solve our problems for us, and that the heavens are empty, and that our prayers are not answered, and that we're alone with one another and have to make the best of it. I, I submit that that's, that's going to be the great problem for civilization from now on. And a lot, of, a lot of energy, moral as well as aesthetic, is going to have to be put into solving it. But the beginning of wisdom is to realize you must emancipate yourself from the idea that, you're, that you are the plaything of a, a supernatural boss. Fortunately, that's not true. John. Well, I don't live in America but I would be very sad to think that in any university, a person that changed their worldview in either direction would no longer feel comfortable because I work at a university where there are all kinds of worldviews and that, to my mind, is the wonderful thing about being there. So I would very much hope a yes. person could still find a lot 
of room and space. That's why universities are so important, that people are free to make these decisions and discuss them. So, yeah, as yeah. to, you would agree with that, Chris? Very much so, yes. Yes, exactly. I'm delighted, by the way, that uh, Christopher admitted that in that answer that he believes in the transcendent. That might lead me to ask the question where it comes from, but perhaps for another time. Yeah. <laughs> there it comes, that's a perfectly good question. It comes from, this a fusion, I think. I can only speak for my, myself because I think, that, as James says in the varieties of religious experience, you may not doubt that people have them, or you shouldn't at any rate, you should grant that they do. You can't make them applicable uh, objectively. They're, they're subjective to the person concerned, but I would say it's roughly where the erotic meets love, meets landscape, meets music and poetry. Um, and it's a, a junction a lot of people, I hope, will be familiar with. Um, if not, I recommend that you try it. Um, <laughs> and then try it again, even more intensely. Uh, for example, I, I wrote a book once about a, a famous building called the Parthenon, which, without which I could not be, without which our civilization couldn't be. Um, Pre-Christian, by the way, as, as is a huge amount of the civilization that Habermas claims to be inspired by it. Um, that to one side. The symmetry and the beauty and the frozen music and poetry of the Parthenon and of the Greek style is an indispensable thing. If it were to be destroyed, I would feel sort of orphaned. But I have no interest in the religion that used to animate it. The cult of Pallas Athena is dead and void to me. So is the idea of Athenian imperialism. So are the so-called mysteries of Eleusis and the rest of it. All that's left for me are the schools of philosophy uh, that are worth studying. So again, it's going to be a question, how do we, how do we assimilate what was to previous generations and previous religions and extinct faiths uh, something so important? How do, we, how do we keep the value that is innate in that without surrendering to the cults um, and illusions that so much animated it? These are, these are very important cultural issues. Okay. And I submit that we can do it. Okay. John, I'll give you the last response on this and then we'll move to our closing well, remarks. Well, just briefly, I just find it a bit difficult to see how a mindless, unguided process produces aesthetics and all these transcendent experiences. Okay, well that may then segue into the closing remarks. Actually, we'll reverse the order of the opening remarks and Professor Lennox will go first and have five minutes and then after that, uh, Mr. Hitchens will wrap up the evening. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I've very much enjoyed this spirited debate. And Christopher Hitchens is certainly a very worthy opponent. In my closing remarks, I just want to address very briefly a point that has not been addressed. Uh, he said in his opening remarks, just in passing, about man-made gods. That is, gods are the figment of our imagination. Well, I would agree that if God does not exist, then Freud can show us clearly how Christianity is an opiate, a comfort blanket, a flight from reality into an imaginary fantasy heaven of wish fulfillment. But if God does exist, then Freud will equally convincingly show us how atheism is a comfort blanket, a flight from the reality of coming face to face with our creator. The Polish Nobel Prize winner for literature, Czesław Miłosz, wrote, a true opium of the people is a belief in nothingness after death, the huge solace of thinking that our betrayals, our greed, our cowardice, our murders are not going to be judged. Ladies and gentlemen, Freud could give you an explanation in both directions, but what Freud cannot do, as Manfred Lutz, the brilliant German psychiatrist, has pointed out, Freud cannot help you at all on the question of whether God exists or not. And that really is the basic question behind our consideration tonight. 
is God great? Of course, presumes that there is a God to be great. And I have argued tonight that there is evidence in the universe of the existence of God, but in particular, that God has revealed himself to us not only in creation, but also in that inbuilt moral sense that we all share. And it seems to me to be enormously important that we see that there's real evidence that points upwards and doesn't point downwards. But I want to conclude by reading to you a Times columnist article written by an atheist, Matthew Paris. He says this, as an atheist, I truly believe that Africa needs God. Missionaries, not aid money, are the solution to Africa's biggest problem, the crushing passivity of the people's mindset. Now a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa, sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international aid efforts. These alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real, the change is good. Those who want Africa to walk tall amid 21st century global competition must not kid themselves that providing the material means or even the know-how that accompanies what we call development will make the change. A whole belief system must first be supplanted, and I'm afraid it has to be supplanted by another. Removing Christian evangelism from the African equation, says an atheist, may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. At the heart of the Christian message is something so utterly great and good that no mere human could do it. And that is the fact that Christ died for the sins of the world. Christopher Hitchens finds it repellent, as he says in his book, the idea of one man dying for another, as one man cannot take another man's sins. He is absolutely right, ladies and gentlemen. When Jesus told a man that his sins were forgiven, the people around at the time were as outraged as Christopher Hitchens. Who can forgive sins, they said, but God alone. But that is exactly the issue. If Jesus is merely a man like all others, then of course it's outrageous, but he isn't. He is man, but he never was merely man. And that's why his death is utterly unique and why millions throughout history and in our world today find peace and forgiveness in his name. At lunchtime, Mr. Hitchens told us he didn't like the imagery of the shepherd and the sheep that occurs in the New Testament because shepherds are usually out to fleece their sheep and eat them. But he missed the point, ladies and gentlemen, because when Jesus Christ said he was the good shepherd, he was making a contrast between himself and earthly shepherds. He said he was there to protect them when the wolves come, that he was there not to kill the sheep, but to be a most unusual shepherd that he would give his life for the sheep. And as for fleecing them and eventually destroying them, what did he say? He said this, I shall lose not one of them. I think this is one of the most magnificent images because it says the exact opposite of what Mr. Hitchens wants it to say. Ladies and gentlemen, God is not only great, Christ has shown us that he is immeasurably great. I'm unable, I can't, I can't afford myself. Um, I find I haven't, it, 
in me to make as an assumption what I need to prove, and I can't get, I can't get comfort this way. You'll have to bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. I can't, I can't applaud uh, as easily as you do uh, consolation offered in that form. I still have unanswered questions, challenges to myself that I feel I must deal with. To my question, uh, can a, could a moral action be performed by a believer and not performed by me? Dr. Lennox, you will have noticed, uh, said um, there's a moral action that a believer could perform that I couldn't, and that was to offer myself as a sacrifice for the redemption of humanity. I think you will see that there's a catch in that answer, in that um, a, a, the average person, uh, unbeliever, can't simultaneously be claiming to be the son of, or perhaps you'd rather say, God himself. And that's before you have to decide whether vicarious redemption, scapegoating, is a moral action in the first instance. So if I may say so modestly, I think that my question still stands and that anyone who heard it would have to say it hadn't yet been answered. And that's by a great theologian at that. Um, I'm a Navy brat myself. I'm from Portsmouth. And there's a famous story about a, a young officer undergoing a, a rigorous examination to, for the, to pass for captain. And he's told to picture himself on a leeward shore with a, a very strong wind driving him towards the rocks. He's asked, what are you going to do? He says, well, I'll cram on all, sa all sail and steer to starboard, hard down on the tiller and on the wheel. So, but the wind keeps coming. It's, you're still being driven on. What are you going to do now? He said, cram on more sail and put, keep the wheel very hard down away from the leeward side. And they said, but, but you're still being driven onto those rocks, young man. What are you going to do now? He says, cram on more sail and keep the keep the rudder and the tiller hard down on the, on the starboard side. And the, he's interrupted, he said, where are, you getting, um, where are you getting all this extra sail from? And he says, the same place you're getting all your extra wind from. <laughs> I want to warn you as I close, ladies and gentlemen, against the dangers of tautology. If everything that cannot be explained, everything that is mysterious to us, numinous, say, or transcendent, must therefore be laid to the charge or the credit of a supernatural being, then Nothing remains to be explained. Everything is in potential explicable. There isn't, there's no problem to begin with. There's no point in this argument. Of course there's no mystery. There's no need for, for cogitation. There's no need for reflection. It must be part of a divine plan. I hope you can see uh, the fallacy that protrudes from that conclusion too. Where does the transcendent come from? I'm happy to say I don't really know what the wellsprings of the transcendent are in me or are in us, but it does no good to say, oh, don't you know, they come to you by divine permission. Nothing is added, nothing is added uh, by that explanation or that, uh, that assumption. I didn't rise to the challenge about atheist regimes in the 20th century, and I really should take a minute, I hope I've got a minute for this. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, if you take out the word fascism from any history of the 1920s and 30s, any decent history, and replace it with the words, the Catholic right wing. You don't need to change anything. Fascism was just another name for the extreme right wing forces of the Roman Catholic Church. That's true whether it's Portugal, Croatia, Poland, Hungary, Italy, and all of these regimes and movements had a, con a specific concordat with the Vatican. You may not say that fascism is a secular or atheist movement, not if you don't want to do great violence to history. Uh, the churches of Germany uh, celebrated the birthday of Adolf Hitler every year till 1945 by order. Uh, and his first, his first significant treaty of the Nazi regime was with the Vatican, a concordat that gave the church a monopoly over the education of German children in, in response for a, a pact uh, that abolished Catholic parties that might challenge the rule of Hitler. That's not secularism, excuse me. It's not atheism either. Quite wrong to say that it is. It's a form of paganism, as a matter of fact, but uh, it would have involved, as well as a compromise with Christianity, the revival of some Nordic myths, but those weren't secular or atheistic either. The cult of Wotan and Odin is not atheism. Um, in the case of the Soviet Union, where uh, the, the population had been told for centuries that the Tsar was like the Pope, uh, divinely inspired and divinely empowered, uh, and where serfdom was justified by the R Russian Orthodox Church, which was a state church. If you're Joseph Stalin, seminarian graduate, seizing power, if you don't know how to exploit a reservoir of credulity and stupidity and passivity 
and servility like that, you shouldn't be in business. And what did he do? He replicated the same thing. There was an inquisition, a heresy hunt, a, a, a promotion of himself as the, as the divine one from whom all blessings flowed, uh, and all the rest of it. And to this day, the Russian Orthodox Church, which never ceased to support Stalin, um, has under Putin actually begun to produce icons. I can show them to you if you doubt me. You can look them up on the Weekly Standard website, any of you tonight. Icons of the Russian Orthodox Church showing Joseph Stalin with a halo around his head. This is not atheism, nor is it secularism. If William Wilberforce was indeed animated by Christianity, I'll make this, I have to make this my closing point, in his campaign against slavery, he should have been. Because it was about time that there was a Christian who said that this trade had gone on long enough. And any Christian should have felt responsible for saying so, because for the entire period of its existence, slavery and the slave trade had been justified directly by reference to the Christian religion and by direct references to the warrant for slavery that's contained in Holy Writ and in Scripture. And that's why we like the captain who wrote Amazing Grace, because he'd been the captain of a slave ship. And he was just as much of a Christian when he was doing the first thing as he was when he was doing the second. The chances, though, that a member of the American Anti-Slavery Society, Thomas Paine, uh, Benjamin Franklin, the others, was not a Christian, would be extremely high. The chances that until very, very, very late in the 19th century, a defender of slavery would be a Christian were statistically enormous. It therefore proves absolutely nothing about Christianity that some of its members finally turned against one of their foulest uh, practices and impositions. And if, if I was a Christian, I would avoid this argument very carefully as tending to show that there is no basis um, in faith uh, for morality, that our morality is innate to us. And it's very nice when sometimes religion catches up to morality for a change. Thank you. Please I'm, help me and thank you, Michael, these gentlemen, for but that. But just on behalf, I just want to say on behalf of the university and the Socratic Club, I want to thank you for coming here, this op uh, taking this opportunity this evening, and it's been a pleasure to provide the Birmingham community with this forum. So thank you very much for your attention. There will be a book signing in the back um, shortly. Uh, thank all of you for coming. <laughs>